Hey, Guns and Gear here, back with another video. Today I'm going to be doing a review slash overview of the Yugo M48 Mauser that you see right here before you. And on top of that, I'm going to be actually doing a little bit of a overview slash history on all the guns around it, all of the other Yugoslavian rifles that were in production and in service before this gun or around the same time as it. And on top of that, I'll be going and comparing and contrasting this rifle and what makes it different than, say, a K98K, which uh, this gun has kind of been billed as a nice, cheap alternative to. You basically get the K98K experience effectively with this gun here, but for anywhere from half to a third of the cost, uh, depending on the K98K in question that you're looking at. So... We'll go into all of that, but to start off, we'll actually need to talk about the predecessors to this gun. This is a post-World War II rifle, but this is not even close to being the first rifle that Yugoslavia uh, actually used. So prior to uh, the end of World War I, Yugosla what, is, what is Yugoslavia was actually part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, fought, of course, with them during World War I. So Yugoslavia was using Austro-Hungarian rifles, so Mannlicher M95s. Uh, they also had Mausers. Austro-Hungary did use Mausers. They used Steyr 1912s. These were uh, basically Gewehr 98s, but with uh, chambered in 7mm Mauser instead of 8. And they also used Gewehr 98s, straight up just Gewehr 98s as well. Yugoslavia particularly uh, liked to use the just standard 8mm Gewehr 98. And there was also the Mannlicher Schnauer, uh that was also used as well. So, after World War I, uh, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was formed. The Yugoslavs were granted their independence. It wasn't quite called Yugoslavia. It was the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. I think it was what it was actually officially called. And uh, not long after World War I, they decided they wanted to produce their own weaponry. They needed to, you know, they, their army had demands and they, they didn't want to buy weaponry, so they decided to start their own weapons manufacturer. So in 1924, they actually bought, uh, to start off, they actually bought a handful of Belgian FN Model 1924 Mausers. They bought about 100,000 of them off of Belgium, and they were brought into the country and were uh, given to the military. And they used that gun really as the basis for their indigenous production. So at the same time in 1924, they also used that as a blueprint to start producing their own guns. This was called the, well, the Model 1924, the Yugo, you know, the Yugo Model 1924. Uh, identical in every regard except for the markings to the FN Model 1924. Uh, they would produce this gun basically all the way until World War II when they were invaded. In April of 1941, Germany, along with some of its other Axis countries, uh, like Romania and Bulgaria, would invade uh, Yugoslavia as well as Greece and whatnot in, uh, in April of 1941. That's basically when production of the rifle halted, all but all but officially. So uh, they produced the gun for about 17 years. They would produce about 780,000 of those rifles. Uh, they were a standard short rifle. They were a 23-inch uh, barrel length, basically identical to this gun. This is also roughly a 23-inch barrel length. Uh, that was kind of the standard length for what was called a short rifle pattern. Somewhere around 23 inches. And uh, it was basically just a Gewehr 98 with a, straight, with a straight bolt, but just a shortened barrel, essentially. So they, uh, like I said, they made 780,000 of those, and then they also had the 100,000 Belgian counterparts imported. And th that was what they used throughout all of the interwar period, and what they also used to uh, to fight the Germans and Italians and Bulgarians and Romanians and Hungarians and whatnot 
during the invasion. Now, Yugoslavia got steamrolled uh, <laughs> during the invasion, but Greece, Greece held up and actually put up a pretty good fight, all things considered. But Yugoslavia got steamrolled. So, but that's what they were using. Uh, not all that incredibly different than, like, this gun you see before you. So. But after World War II, uh, Yugoslavia obviously got its independence back, and they trans were in the midst of a transitional government. They decided to do away with the monarchy and the kingdom. And then over the next couple of years made a transition into what was uh, basically their, their socialist government they would have throughout the rest of the Cold War. But uh, during World War II, interestingly enough, Yugoslavia arguably waged what was effectively probably the best partisan campaign against the German occupation of the war. Um, so in doing this, they actually managed to capture a large amount of German equipment from 1941 to 45. And in particular, they would catch or capture a large number of German K-98s during this time. It's unknown how many they caught exactly, but a large number of German K-98s would be captured by Yugoslavian partisans. And uh, after the war, the, the year after, in 1946, they would actually start refurbishing and converting all of those guns to their liking. They didn't really do anything with them. All they did was basically bring them back into the factory, um, which would have been the Zastava factory, actually, at this time. And they would have re-blued them, re, you know, if, if they were damaged or anything, they would redo the stock, re-blue them, re-barrel them if they needed to. And they would also remark the markings on the gun. So all of the German and Nazi markings on the gun would get scrubbed, and they would redo it with their Yugoslavian markings. These were called uh, several different names. One name was the M46 Mauser. The Yugo M46 is kind of the nickname. The proper name is the M98-48. Is what I've... I think that's the, really the true proper name. But yeah, they did these conversions from basically 1946 through 1948, basically. Again, it's not known how many of them were done. Can't really tell you. But they spent basically the next three years going back and refurbishing all of their captured K-98s. I would have to imagine it was probably at least 100,000, if not more. Uh, because they're, they're fairly common. Uh, there's not a lot of them. They're not as common as, say, this gun. But they are out there, and there are a lot of them in the U.S. So I'd have to say it's at least six figures. So that was the first thing they did after World War II. Um, the following year, in 1947, they went back and started doing the same thing to all of their, their M24s, their 1924 Mausers. Now, I forgot to mention, they, the, the 1924 Mauser actually came in two different variants. There was the standard 23-inch rifle, but there was also a carbine. There was a 20-inch, so three inches shorter, there was a 20-inch carbine as well that was made uh, as well. So starting in 1947, they went back and started refurbishing all of their indigenously produced Model 1924s. They didn't really do a whole lot to them. Basically, they just went back, repaired them, re them, uh, rebarreled them if need be. All of the carbines actually got rebarreled. So if you actually out there and look around, the original model 1924 carbine is incredibly rare. Or the ones with the original 20 inch barrel. They basically don't exist anymore. Or because they pretty much all but entirely got rebarreled with a new 23 inch barrel. They, they essentially don't exist anymore for the most part. And if you can find them, they're they're incredibly rare or and expensive. So they started doing that in 1947. They went back through their all their old inventory of all of their 1924s, all 780,000 of them. There is some attrition. I would imagine a lot of them 
probably got destroyed during the war or before. So there was some attrition, obviously. But they started that, and that would continue basically all the way until about 1952. And then in 1952, they then went back and did the same thing to all of their Belgian ones they had. The 100,000 Belgian rifles they had left over. Those were called M24 slash 52s. They're basically identical to the 47, the M24-47s, except for the markings. Uh, they have Belgian markings on them. Um, so, other than that, they're the same. Um, the, the 52s nowadays are actually pretty desirable, and they're quite rare. You don't see very many of them nowadays because they're, you know, basically eight times as, 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 eight times as less many were, were manufactured. So they're a lot more rare, or, um, and they generally will demand a little bit more of a of a higher price on the market. So that that happened as well, and they they started converting all of those as well. Uh, and they also had to standardize a few things. the The Belgian and the M twenty four forty sevens were a little bit different, um, not just on the markings, but they had some like different sling, uh, sling swivels and whatnot. Basically, they then standardized that between the two on the 47 and the 52. Uh, and they are literally identical except for the markings now. So, on top of that, instead of just converting their existing lot that they already had, they also felt the need to start producing new rifles from scratch. That's where this gun comes in, the M48. Uh, the plan to start producing brand new rifles was approved in 1948 and uh, was given the go-ahead, hence the name the M48. But production actually wouldn't begin until 1950. And uh, like the K98, this gun actually went through several design changes during its production run. Changes that were made to make the gun a little cheaper and simpler to produce, just like the K98 did. So production would begin in 1950 and would go all the way until basically 1965. So about 15 years of production and about one and a quarter million, one and a quarter million of these guns would be manufactured. So, and uh, interestingly enough, a lot of these guns are in really good condition to this day uh, because the, the Yugoslavians took really good care of their guns. Uh, it was actually mandatory that every five years, these every single gun would be taken out of, of storage and cleaned and inspected. All one and a quarter million of them. And also including the other, the other ones, the 52s, the, the K98s, and the 52s and the 47s. All of these guns would have to be taken out every five years, cleaned and inspect it. And then if, if something had gone wrong, they would then be sent to the factory and refurbished. This happened every five years until they have come over here, basically. So that's why a lot of these Yugo rifles are in such good shape today. Uh, the Yugoslavians really took care of their guns. So, But getting back to the M48, this gun went through... Basically, there's there's basically four, actually really five, different versions of this gun that exist. We have the original Yugo M48, which is actually what this one is. Uh, the original Yugo M48 was is arguably the highest quality one of the bunch. It's made from entirely milled parts. No cost-cutting measures were done on the gun, basically. Uh, it's made from high quality elm or uh, or or walnut, and uh, like I said, all of the little superfluous uh, parts are uh, milled instead of stamped, which would change later. Same thing with the K ninety eight, basically. So these were produced. The standard Yugo M forty eights were produced uh, until nineteen fifty two, basically just from fifty to fifty two. Uh, but they really cranked them out. I mean, they, they did make actually a lot of them during those those short years. That's what this one is. It's all milled. So, 
And they'll have a stamping on them. You'll have either an M48 stamp on the crest or an M48A stamp on the crest. So that leads me to the, the next gun. And then in 1952 to 1956, they produced what was called the M48A. The only difference between this, this gun and the M48A is the floor plate. So they actually switched over to a stamped floor plate instead of a milled. That's it. That's the only difference. And if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't even notice the difference, really. So they switched over to a stamped floor plate just as a cost-saving measure. You know, the milled floor plate's really not necessary. So just as a little bit of a cost-saving measure to make things a little bit easier, save a little bit time, more time on manufacture, save a little bit more money. So that continued all the way until 56. And then in 1956, they introduced what was called the B model, the M48B. This would be produced all the way until 1965 when production stopped. The B sees the introduction of additional stamped parts. So we have the introduction of a stamped trigger guard. And we have the introduction of stamped barrel bands. That's it. Uh, other than that, it's identical. Ooh. And again, if you weren't looking for it, and if you didn't know, you wouldn't even notice the difference. Interestingly enough as well, the all M48Bs are stamped M48A eh, on the receiver. Then. Oh. So that's kind of interesting. Eh. On top of that, around the same time, starting in 1956, they also produced what was called the M48BO, or... It's either BO or B0. I think it's BO. This gun is identical to the B, except it has no receiver marks. So the receiver, uh, there's no crest and there's no markings along the side. All scrub, all markings and any sort of serial numbers and markings on the gun are scrubbed and aren't there. These guns were made and were intended to be exported to other countries. And they were exported. Uh, a handful of African countries actually bought those. Um, various Middle Eastern and Asian countries bought bought them in numbers as well. So that's what they would have been given. They would have been given guns that had no markings or serial numbers on them. That's a BO. BOs are pretty rare nowadays. You don't see very many of the BOs on the market. Uh, they're they're actually fairly rare. Uh, they're pretty cool, but they're not any different or any better than any of the others. So, take that as you will. So those were, the B's and the B.O.'s were produced until 65, and uh, that's basically when production stopped on them. There was one other gun. The fifth and final gun would be the M48-63. These were produced for a short couple of years, and they were what were referred to as the tanker the tanker model. This basically is a M48, but it's got a shortened, uh, an increased shortened barrel. Um, they brought the barrel back down to the carbine length of the original M24. So we were looking at about a 20, 19 or 20 inch barrel on those tanker models. Are they really a tanker model? Uh, not really. I, I There's been really no evidence to suggest they were used by tank crews or vehicle crews or anything. It's kind of just a nickname that's been given to them by a company over here called Mitchell's Mausers. They make copies of them. Basically what Mitchell's Mausers do is they take these guns, these M48s, and they just convert them into the 63s, and they call them the tanker model. So, not actually a proper name for it. They were just a carbine. It was just a, a short-lived carbine model they started producing in 63. From what I've actually read about those guns, is they were actually intended to be used by civilians. Those guns were actually intended for the civilian market, um, not for tank crews or anything like that. So, But that's about it. Um, as far as production goes, overall, like I said, about one and a quarter million would be produced. And they are, the M48s are the most numerous of any Yugoslav Mauser uh, you're going to find. The A, the A is probably the most common. 
the one that has the mill, the stamped um, floor plate. Those are the A's are going to be the most common, but they're all good. And that's really about it. Uh, these guns would see combat. I mean, they would uh, to an extent, particularly the M48s. They would see combat actually during the Balkan Wars in the 90s a little bit. Um, when that whole thing kicked off, these guns would be kind of brought back out of storage uh, and would be given a little bit of use, you know, with, say, maybe paramilitary units, police. Uh, there have been, you know, it has been shown that these were brought back out and used as sniper rifles particularly as well. Uh, they would mount the uh, they they mounted a four by thirty two uh, scope on them. They would drill and tap them and mount a uh, a scope on them and use them as sniper rifles during those wars in the nineties. So these guns did see combat, probably in a little bit of a limited role, but they did they did see some use during the Balkan Wars in the nineties uh, as well. Some of them, not very many of them, from what I can tell. Not very many of them, though. Maybe, uh, I would say probably maybe a couple tens of thousands maybe got brought out of storage to be used. That's probably about it. But that's a little bit of the combat history of them. The For the most part, the M24, 47s, and 52s saw no combat at all. They actually might have during World War II. But then, you know, they got refurbished and uh, rebuilt after the war. So you could say some of them saw combat maybe during World War II to an extent. Um, but that's about it. That's uh, as far as history goes but with the Yugoslav rifles. That's going to be about it. So these guns are a really good alternative to the, uh, the German K98. You basically get kind of the K98K experience for again half to a third of the cost. Uh, shooter grade K98s nowadays are six or seven hundred plus. You can get these for under four hundred dollars. I paid two fifty for this one uh, a couple months ago at a pawn shop, a local pawn shop. Uh, I <laughs> two hundred fifty bucks for what is effectively, in terms of feel and spirit, I guess you could say, is a K98K basically. You get the K98. I'm getting the K98K experience for a quarter of the cost, basically. You know? So. Uh, this gun is a little bit different than uh, the previous ones, like the M2447 and uh, the, the 52 and whatnot. It is a little different. Um, for one, we see a, a much different stock composition. We have the whole stock that you put the sling through much like a K98K the uh, the M24s and the 47s and the 52s still retain the standard swivel Gewehr 98 style sling we see the introduction of the cupped K98K butt plate uh as well the other ones didn't had just the standard flat um Gewehr 98 butt plate we see the introduction of a curved bolt handle as well on this gun. And uh, we also see the introduction of the sight hood protector as well. Those couple of differences are basically what makes this gun different than say the M2447 and the 52 and the M24 and whatnot. Those are a few of the differences that kind of set it apart. And then later you also see the introduction of the stamped parts as well for uh, production's sake. Uh, those are a couple of things that make this gun different. If you spot a Yugo Mauser that has a, a, a sight protector, it's probably going to be an M48. Some M2447s and 52s did get sight protectors, but not all of them. If you see a Yugo Mauser that doesn't have a sight protector, it's probably going to be a 47. But some 47s did get sight protectors. Really, the best way to know is to look at the butt plate or the sling mount. If it has both of these, it's an M48. That's the easiest way to... Or if it has a curved bolt handle as well. So, um, Now, you get, the, you get the K98K experience with this gun, but it is not a K98K. 
there are actually some significant differences between this gun and a K98. Um, one is the top handguard. We have a lot of wood up here. The K98 actually uh, did not have a top handguard for the most part. Um, the rear sight on the K98K is actually brought all the way to the back of the receiver back here. And then you've got a handguard that's a solid piece of wood out here. The K98K also had an exposed barrel here. There is no wood covering the barrel here. So this little wood piece here was deleted as well on the K98. Um, the bolt is actually significantly different. Um, a Yugo M48 bolt is not um, compatible with a K98 bolt. The Yugo M48 bolt is actually a little bit shorter. It's a little bit of a more intermediate, shorter action than a K98. The K98K bolt is actually still a full Gewehr 98 length action. This one is a little bit shorter. It's about uh, about half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch shorter in overall length, but they're not compatible. You cannot swap bolts. You can actually get the bolt all the way in, but it won't it won't turn because the, uh, the locking lugs are not actually matching up in the channel properly. Because again, the bolt is longer or shorter, depending on which one you're putting in each other. So, uh, other than that, that's about it. You know, you've got the different bolt, the different handguard and side arrangement, and then you've got like the exposed barrel. Other than that, there's not a whole lot different between this gun and a K98. Um, some K98s, or particularly early K98s, also did not have the cup butt plate. Some of the early production ones. Uh, later on, uh, when the K98 started switching over to stamped pieces, the uh, barrel band actually changed. The Germans went away from the what was called the H-shaped barrel band, and they went with just a solid rectangular-shaped stamped one. So that's technically different as well, depending on the K98 as, as well. Uh, but other than that, that's about it. Not a whole lot of difference. It's really just kind of cosmetic changes, really, for the most part. But the, bolt, the bolts are different. Um, the K98 also had a cutout here for the bolt handle to sit in. So the bolt handle actually went a little bit further in because the K98 had this cutout in the stock. So you could kind of get up under the bolt handle a little easier to turn it. Um, other than that, that's about it. So there's not a whole lot of difference between this gun and a K98. Um, but you get the experience is what is what everyone says. And I, I, I tend to agree. You get the kind of K98K experience for a far less cost. So, um, I'll actually flip it over. I have it propped up on a box of nine millimeter. <clears throat> there it is on the other side. It uses a standard, you know, it's got a standard, basically K98K type sling as well. Um, this came with it. Uh, my gun is all matching except for the stock. The stock is not matching. Uh, the Yugoslavs numbered their stocks, usually. So other than the stock, it does not match. All the other metal parts are matching. But the stock is not, sadly. That's pretty common um, with these rifles, particularly Yugos and Germans, for the most part. Yeah, there are, there are, I would say when it comes to K98s, more K98s are not matching than are. Um, usually you'll see most K98s, the bolt doesn't match. Or something. This gun is all ma all the metal parts match except for the stock. So the original stock on the gun probably got damaged, and they had they replaced it with another one. It's probably what happened. Um, but it's in good shape. Metal's great. The bore is excellent. Shoots great. It's accurate. It's just a standard good Mauser. Uh, the sight picture is really interesting with that hood protector. You get this kind of really strange sight picture that's kind of different than any other gun out there in, in any other Mauser. This is the only Mauser I own that has a sight protector, so it's it's a lot different. And I, I, I it kind of, in my experience, kind of tends to make you shoot better. 
you get a little bit better of a sight picture with that protector, I think. So, but these are good guns. Uh, they're cheap. And I really think for the money, this is probably the best Mauser on the market. This and the, the 2447 are probably the best Mausers on the market for your money. And probably as far as surplus rifles go for the money, it's probably the best deal on the market as far as surplus rifles go. So I'd highly recommend it. Go over the trigger pull. Trigger pull is actually pretty okay. It does shoot, of course, 8mm Mauser. I've got a uh, German surplus stripper clip here. PPU ammo. That's about it. Uh, I think I pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover as far as the Yugoslavians go. So uh, get them while you can. These these guns do come in occasionally still. We do still get imports. I don't think we've gotten imports in a while, though. It's been a while since we've gotten any imports of, of these guns. It's been a couple of years, I think. But they're drying up, and the prices have been creeping up. I just happened to find a really good deal on these guns. Uh, the one that's particularly notable is the the actual K98s, the, the, the M46s or the 98-48s, the actual proper K98 ones that the Yugoslavs captured. Those have been just screaming up in price lately. Uh, not too long ago, those, those which are actual, those are actual K-98s. Let me remind you, those are actual K-98s that were captured and then refurbished. Uh, those were not any less cheap than, the, or any more expensive than these. I mean, you could get those for 400 bucks as well a couple of years ago. But those have, uh, those have skyrocketed in price the last couple of years because I think a lot of people have realized, oh, oh, wow, those are actual K-98s. So now they're demanding kind of standard shooter grade K98 prices now. They're a lot better, they're in a lot better shape than a shooter grade K98. But they're demanding that price now. And we have actually gotten shipments of those in lately. We've actually had a couple of those shipments of those guns come in the last year or two. But they're they're going for $600 now. Those are going for 550 to 650 nowadays. So I really can't recommend them anymore. But you are basically getting a, a a very good to excellent condition K98 for a fair shooter grade price. So I think it's actually still a, a deal technically, you could say. But this gun is really where it's at. I guess before I wrap the video up, I will uh, kind of show you the uh, markings again. M48. Again, if it's an A or a B, it'll have an, a little A next to it. And you've got the crest. All of these guns on the side will have, uh, you know, like this marking and then this with a 44. Uh, that does not mean it was made in 44. That was just, I believe, that's when the factory was set up. So that basically tells you it was made in uh, the Zastava factory, I believe, from what I can tell. So all of those guns will have that marking. No, that does not mean it was made in uh, in 1944. I think that's when the the factory was was established. I'll set you down here. And I'll uh, show you some close ups or uh, just uh, some handling. Bolt's pretty smooth. Don't know if I'm really in frame there with that. Pretty good gun. Not gonna lie. Uh, trigger pull's pretty good for a surplus rifle. Wouldn't expect really any less, you know, from a Mauser. I guess. Uh, one, yeah, I, I did forget, uh, unlike a K98 as well, uh, the bolts are left in the white. Not blued. All K all K ninety eight Ks have blued bolts. These are left in the white. That's another another minor difference I forgot. Um, try and get you a 
bit of a bit of a sight picture. It's gonna be kind of hard. Uh, hold on. It's going to be probably a little bit difficult, but you can kind of get the gist. That's kind of roughly what it looks like right there. A little different than your typical Mauser or surplus rifle, really, of any kind. So, um, that's about it. That about sums up my thoughts, I suppose. Um, getting back to the point, I, I highly recommend you get one of them. Get them before, before you can. Deals are still out there to be had. Uh, if you had to, if I honestly, if there was one surplus rifle you need to buy, this is probably one of them. Mosins are still a pretty good value, but this is a much better rifle than a Mosin. So that's going to about do it, I guess. That's my overall thoughts and history and everything behind the gun and all of its uh, successors and predecessors and what have you. Buy them. Buy them when you can. 10 out of 10 rifle in my mind. Uh, thanks for watching the video. I will be doing more, more uploads, more videos. I've got a, several more planned within the next week or, week or so. So stay tuned for that. I am Guns and Games. I think I said Guns and Gear at the beginning of the video. That's a, that's another YouTuber that does guns on YouTube. I've been watching him lately. I guess I just kind of I had a Freudian slip, I suppose. That's going to be about it. Thanks for watching the video and I'll catch you in the next one.